The Connecticut River flows through one of the most complex landscapes in North America. This American Heritage River originates in relatively pristine headwaters along the Canadian border in northern Vermont and New Hampshire. As it flows south, it divides Vermont and New Hampshire. The river soon encounters areas of intensive agriculture and development in Massachusetts and central Connecticut. It then turns abruptly to the southeast, continues through 60 miles of mostly rural land, and empties into Long Island Sound. The Connecticut has no major city at its mouth, making this tidal estuary all the more valuable. In fact, the Nature Conservancy has called the Lower Connecticut one of the last great places. Managing natural resources in this urbanized landscape presents many challenges. No single land use dominates. Instead, a complex overlay of established uses competes for resources. Each land use impacts the river in a different way, but together give a sense of the challenge faced here. The biggest impact today comes from residential and commercial development. The 11,000 square mile watershed hosts 390 towns and cities and 2.3 million people. Many of these people have chosen to move away from traditional urban centers. The resulting sprawl consumes agricultural land at an alarming rate. As more open lands succumb to development, habitat is fragmented or lost and water quality suffers. The effects can directly be seen on the river and farther downstream in critical tideland habitats. 70% of the fresh water in Long Island Sound is delivered by the Connecticut River. The ecological health of the tidelands and the sound depend directly upon the water quality in the upland tributaries. In these tidelands and elsewhere, invasive plant species have established a firm hold. Land managers struggle with eradicating or at least limiting these species before native plants are completely overwhelmed. Anadromous fish can tell us a great deal about this landscape's overall condition. Atlantic salmon, shad, and other migratory species were once plentiful, but are now severely threatened. Spawning habitat has been greatly reduced and often blocked off completely. Mill dams from the 1700s still block migration paths on many of the river's 38 tributaries. Within this intensely developed context, however, the river has some very enthusiastic allies. Community members, landowners, and agency managers have joined together to fight the trends that threaten this watershed. Already, much of the point source pollution has been reduced or eliminated. The focus now is reconnecting the watershed by restoring and protecting the overall function and health of the ecosystem. This area seems to have always been the focus of much activity, even in a geologic time frame. An appreciation of these events can lead to a better understanding of the present day topography and soils. So we're here at Dinosaur State Park in Rocky Hill, Connecticut. And of course you always think of dinosaurs being a Western thing. And though in Connecticut we have evidence that dinosaurs were here too. So there's hundreds of dinosaur tracks that you can come and see here. And the history of Connecticut is a long one. The rocks here in Connecticut, our oldest rocks are as old as um, 600 million years old. The more recent history of Connecticut is about two million years ago. Um, the Connecticut River kind of started flowing the way that it does now through its watershed. And of course, during that time, there was glaciation. The glaciers came through Connecticut a number of times. So what we ended up with is a glaciated landscape and this long valley. And this valley is deep enough and long enough that it really has its own microclimate. So it's a little bit warmer, a little bit more humid than the rest of the state. It has a very long growing season for this part of, of the world, about 200 day growing season. And these rocks that were here because of the basalt, which we call trap rock, and the sedimentary rocks that formed from those ancient soils millions of years ago. And when those got ground up and laid down by the glacier, we have these unique red soils in the Connecticut Valley. So we have some unique soils in the, in the valley here. The valley, because it's a rift valley, this big crack that was in the earth goes from Long Island Sound all the way up to Vermont and New Hampshire.
So the reason why it's important to understand this early history of Connecticut and the, the um, bedrock geology and how it was formed is that the rocks that you see here, these red Triassic, Jurassic sandstones and siltstones are the, basically the, the foundation of the parent material that our for, soils have formed in today. We're here on the floodplain of the Connecticut River and the soils here and the soil landscapes are legendary for their agricultural productivity. When the Native Americans started raising corn and beans and squash, the first place that they came to raise their crops was here on the floodplain of the Connecticut River. Since then, people have continued to farm the Connecticut River floodplain, and fortunately, it has less of the development potential than the upland soils. So not that people don't put golf courses and uh, parking lots and other things on the floodplain of the Connecticut River, but it's still dominantly from Vermont and New Hampshire all the way down through Rocky Hill, Glastonbury, where the floodplain is wide enough to farm that it's dominantly in agriculture. And as you can see here, we have well-drained, very silty soils, as I mentioned, for the, the uplands, and it has kind of a, a, a reddish, pinkish cast to it. The uplands from those red Triassic materials that were eroded and then became part of the glacial till and glacial outwash as they've eroded in the uplands and carried by the various tributaries down along the Connecticut River. And the Connecticut River floods annually the silts and very fine sands are deposited. So we have well-drained, silty soils and uh, very agriculturally productive. Earliest records of this area come from dinosaur tracks and other fossils. Beginning about 10,000 years ago, Native Americans moved onto this landscape. Agriculture and fishing were critical parts of their lives. Indians settled near water, first of all, as, as obviously for, for drinking purposes, but also because of navigation. When you get the rivers like this, it provides a, a highway of travel, a highway of trade that can come up and down. But we also see very intensive settlement here along the floodplain of the river, starting at about a thousand years ago when Native Americans were starting to grow corn, beans, and squash. So they were taking advantage of the rich floodplain soils and setting up villages. The village right over my uh, shoulder here was occupied about eight to 900 years ago and probably represented a, a, a large village of maybe eight or 900 people even. So that these were prime areas for agricultural growth. When we look at where the English settled down on the New England coast when they first got a foothold here, these are the same exact places that Native Americans had large villages everywhere from Boston and New London, New Haven, Newark, Baltimore, all these areas that Native Americans had already cleared some land in some cases to grow their crops. They had already settled in villages. Europeans basically get a foothold on this continent, not because this was a wilderness, but because there were already people here that already had used the land and modified the land. So instead of our ancestors coming here to this complete wilderness, what they came to in New England, anyhow, is a, a land that maybe over 150,000 people were already occupying. And that allowed the European foothold on this continent much quicker than it would have been had this truly been a wilderness. When the colonists came here, of course, they were taught by the Indians how to grow some of the crops they were growing, and they were also able to grow some of the crops that they knew from Europe because of the excellent soils. So Connecticut was one of those, considered one of those provision states for the colonists and for the early part of our country, all the way up until the West was cleared. Most of the significant agriculture uh, was in the Northeast, and particularly the Connecticut Valley was known for its, its productive agricultural soils. That history has continued throughout the Industrial Revolution, that agriculture is still very important to the history and the economy of the Connecticut Valley or these Connecticut lowlands. Because of the excellent soils, a lot of specialty crops are grown. When the, the colonists came here, the Indians were already growing tobacco. And as tobacco became fashionable in Europe, tobacco became a very important part of the Connecticut Valley culture and economy. At one point in time, there were thousands of acres of tobacco grown in the Connecticut Valley. And that tobacco is still grown today. It's a very expensive crop to grow. During the, one of those time periods when cigars were out of fashion, a lot of those excellent soils went into truck crops, fruits and vegetables, 
and nursery and turf production as well. So a lot of high value crops. European development began in the early 1600s. Farms quickly spread on the rich valley bottoms. America's Industrial Revolution also started in this region, with water mills supplying the power. When the English first came here, they referred to the Indians as being primarily farmers and fishermen because of the southern New England complex, not only with the coastline, but because of the rivers coming up. Uh, Native American settlements were logistically spread, not only to use the floodplain soils, but also to utilize the, the fish that were coming up here, especially off the, the secondary drainages that enter into the primary rivers. We have campsites that primarily were occupied during the spring season when the anadromous fish runs were coming. Very important resource here in New England for Native peoples. We have accounts of the English when they first settled here of the, the fish being so thick here during the anadromous spring runs that you could literally walk across the river on the backs of salmon and other, other anadromous fish that were coming up here. How true that is, we don't know. But that gave us an idea of how plentiful these resources were. At the main stem of the Connecticut River, which had the largest salmon run of any river in the Northeast, um, was effectively dammed at Turner's Falls in the late 1700s. So it wasn't too long after that. All these dams on all these these thousands of miles of tributaries that the salmon and the herring and the shad and the alewives needed. And then this major obstacle at Turner's Falls, which is kind of at the Massachusetts border, basically did in the Atlantic salmon. We're here in Lyme, Connecticut on the banks of the east branch of the Eight Mile River, looking at uh, a barrier that has stopped anadromous fish for hundreds of years. Anadromous fish are the species of fish that begin their life in freshwater, migrate out into the ocean to reach maturity, and then return back to freshwater where they originated to complete their life cycle, to spawn. And here in Connecticut, as well as throughout the northeast of the United States, all of these small streams were great habitat for anadromous fish species. Now, these species that we're talking about include Atlantic salmon, American shad, alewife, blueback herring, in some cases striped bass, sea lamprey, and there's others too, but those are the species that we tend to focus on. Historians and anthropologists tell us that this part of the world had one of the densest populations of aboriginal peoples, and one of the reasons were the fisheries resources. These fish mostly run up the streams in late winter and early spring, at a time when the food storage of the Indians, the early Indians, had been depleted. So just when these fish, these people were facing starvation, huge quantities of high energy and tasty fish would be delivered to their doorstep. They didn't have to go out and net them. They didn't have to go in search of them. In many cases, in a small stream like this, they could just reach down, literally reach down and pick them up. As this area was settled and developed, we started uh, industrializing the area and building dams such as this. This dam, probably built in the 1700s, powered a series of mills, perhaps a grist mill, perhaps a sawmill, later on maybe manufacturing a small item like, a, like knife handles or ax handles or something like that. At that point, the jobs and the industry was more important than the natural resource and they didn't have the technology to get fish beyond the dam. They didn't worry about the fish. The dams blocked the fish migration. Many species, most notably Atlantic salmon, need to get to the very headwaters of the stream to spawn. There is no appropriate spawning habitat for them downstream of the of the dam. Therefore, when that wall was created across their migratory pathway, they couldn't get upstream to spawn, they didn't spawn, their population died out. This rich history leads us to today's critical issues and conditions. Reconnecting those migratory paths and protecting habitat are vital management goals. Preserving Connecticut's agricultural function is also an important objective. Many partners along the Connecticut are working towards these goals in the face of some significant challenges. The best agricultural soils are in the valley, 
they're also the most vulnerable to development, the easiest to develop. So we have these cities, the Industrial Revolution, here in the valleys, brought all these people in here, and that's, of course, where the prime farmland is, the best farmland is. And that is also where our um, drinking water aquifers are in these, these gravel-filled valleys as well. And in the uplands, you know, as we continue to sprawl across the landscape, uh, truncate those natural drainage patterns. The Connecticut River watershed has about 20,000 miles of streams. You know, we get 44 to 56 inches of rain here, so there's a lot of precipitation, a lot of surface water runoff, groundwater runoff, all going into the valleys. So we've, as we have increased our impervious area from development in the uplands, we've seen streams bec become unraveled. We've seen our wetlands dry up because of changes in hydrology. Uh, we're not able to maintain the base flows to our streams. So those are some of the impacts to development. For many years now, the Nature Conservancy has been concerned with development's effect on the Connecticut's ecosystem, especially in the Tideland areas. This is one of those last great places because there is a large area of land, such as we see here today, that is still, for the most part, undeveloped. And it's also at the mouth of one of America's largest and greatest rivers, the Connecticut River. That gives rise not only to great beauty and some interesting history, culturally, but in terms of nature. Uh, we have an abundance of rare species, all kinds of species of plants and animals. We have large intact natural communities like the tidal marsh that we're uh, at today. So what makes this place one of the last great places is its large scale and abundance of diverse natural communities and rare and endangered species. There is a very important connection between that upland landscape and these tidal marsh communities, and even the Connecticut River, where these tidal marsh communities lie along. And in fact, with the Connecticut River, then into Long Island Sound. And what connects all of them is water. Uh, the rain that falls down drains through the landscape of these forested communities and into rivers that all flow into these tidal marsh communities. And then through those tidal marsh communities, the rivers flow, the waters flow into the Connecticut River, ultimately into Long Island Sound. So there's this tremendous connection between uh, all of these, these communities. And what has helped maintain these tidal marsh communities is that the uplands that we keep referring to are remarkably intact. But that is all changing. There is tremendous pressure for this area to grow and develop. Um, as access to it has improved uh, and as people's willingness to commute longer distances has grown, there are tremendous pressures to grow. And so the, the greatest single threat to this system, to the uplands, to the forest, to the, to the intactness of the forest communities and the many species like interior nesting birds that they support, the threat to the health of these tidal marsh communities and the water quality that, that feeds and sustains these tidal marshes and even ultimately the threat to the Connecticut River itself is this rapid expansion of growth. It is basically cutting up this landscape that is our greatest threat. Another important partner is the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection. Within their fisheries restoration efforts, they have worked to restore migration paths along the river's main stem and tributaries. We now can work with landowners and dam owners to get fish beyond these barriers. We can either remove the dam, which is preferable because it, it restores native habitat as well as reconnects the migratory pathway or if that's not possible we can build fishways to let the fish get up into that habitat. What's important here though is that habitat has to exist in good condition in order to make that worthwhile. We can build a fishway but if the habitat uh, is in poor condition the fish won't go up there and it will it'll be a waste of money. We need to be concerned with particularly loss of habitat through urban sprawl. As, as population grows, as more homes are built, more people want to live in towns like this, and well-meaning people may want to build their home right next to the stream and, and cut down all of the trees. And so there's a lot of issues. While we're all working on, on our specialty, mine has to be, happens to be anadromous fish, we all have to educate the people and um, make sure that they're not biting the hand that feeds them. They're not coming to a place like this for the nature and in the same process hurting, hurting that very nature. When we first started this, uh, there was a lot of skepticism of how much impact we could have. 
we've already opened up 100 miles, over 100 miles of stream to migratory fish. We're in the process of opening up another 100 miles. And I suspect that uh, before, before I go out to pasture, we'll probably open up a third 100 miles. So um, this is not something that we have to wait indefinitely for. It may be a long time before we're actually angling for salmon, but it won't be that long before we see fish spawning in our communities. That in itself uh, leads to other benefits. We're seeing increased numbers of nesting ospreys, and, and one of the reasons is because the ospreys are eating the alewives, and the alewives' numbers are going up because we're restoring them to habitats like this. And so we're seeing benefits immediately, and we're gonna continue to see those benefits. The Connecticut River Watershed Council works across all four states of the watershed in partnership with private and public land managers. The council is the only watershed-wide organization. We serve all four states of the Connecticut River. It's 11,260 square miles of, of watershed. That's a lot of space. And yet there is a willingness of people uh, landowners and, and, and citizens to come together and to figure out how to solve the problems that are con confronting the uh, environment. We're uh, really focusing on two areas, uh, fisheries restoration and also uh, land use as it relates to development and sprawl uh, in all reaches of the river. The Council is engaging uh, in terms of fisheries restoration in a variety of ways. We have two river stewards who manage our fisheries restoration program, and they are working uh, at the grassroots level in communities and towns across the watershed to install fishways and also to remove dams. Uh, there are over a thousand dams in the watershed. The Conti National Fish and Wildlife Refuge manages resources across the watershed, yet owns no significant part of that land. Instead, private owners are enlisted as management partners through education and cost-sharing programs. Congress gave us the purpose of going out and protecting the uh, diversity and abundance of all the species in a 7.2 million acre watershed. And so when we looked at that, at that mission and how to accomplish it, um, we immediately saw that if we purchased lands that would help do that, we could only purchase 2% of the watershed. We didn't feel like that would do much. But when we looked at lands that were being managed by state agencies and by watershed, watershed lands that were owned for the city of, to produce water for the city of Boston and whatnot, that's more like 22% of the watershed. And we felt like if we could help those folks understand the wildlife issues, we could get somewhere. Our primary mission deals with migratory species and I think that again what we can do to all the citizens of the watershed but also especially to those landowners that can actually manage their land to help these migratory species is to give them that, to give everyone a, a picture of how their particular town fits into this system to look at the landscape and to look how this at how this ecosystem works. And, and a big part of that is the fish coming up the river and migrating upstream, and the birds coming up and using the river. What we do try and do is stay very close to our mission, which is to protect the rare things, rare species, and to work with the migratory species, and also to look at the health of the ecosystem that other people aren't worrying about. And I think invasive plants is one of those areas where we've seen kind of a vacuum. In New England, there's not the county weed boards and things that there are in other parts of the country, and yet invasive weeds are a huge problem. And one of the things that we've been trying to do is reach a lot of people so that they understand that everything that's green isn't, isn't good. And it's a hard sell, frankly, to, to get people to understand what a threat these, some of these species are. Much of the stewardship responsibility lies in the hands of individual landowners. Increasingly, the stewardship ethic is spread to those most closely tied to the land. One of the things that uh, changed my life was reading Aldo Leopold's Sand County Almanac, where he described uh, that the most important part of the land was the part uh, between the cultivated fields and 
and the forest uh, in which uh, a lot of people thought of as wasteland. And you see a lot of what uh, farmers call weeds around me here. And this is the area in which we find enormous biodiversity. And so I got interested at, at the time I read his book uh, in looking more closely at uh, what was around me. This land is on the upland uh, headwaters of the Eight Mile River. The headwaters of the Eight Mile River uh, run down uh, to uh, the tidelands of the Connecticut River, and we've uh, learned that that's one of the most important uh, uh, areas left as a natural area. Between here and there, uh, I've uh, worked with other landowners and partners who uh, have uh, worked to get fish ladders. Uh, the anandromous fish are now coming back to this valley for the first time in 200 years. One of the most amazing changes in my lifetime is the return of the beaver. The beaver took those areas that were ditched, plugged them back up. Uh, we know from the soils types what used to be uh, wetlands, and they've restored almost exactly to the government maps where all of the wetlands were uh, in historic times. And the number of birds that used the little beaver ponds uh, is enormously increased over what it was when I was a child. We need to be a farm in the sense that we produce uh, something for uh, society from the land. But certain fields are really difficult especially in New England where most of what we grow is rocks. Uh, and uh, fields uh, that are surrounding me right now are ones that were traditionally very difficult, often abandoned, and would just be woodlands again if we abandoned them completely. What I've tried to do in my own life is to take those fields that weren't working out well for intensive cultivation, but to continue to the mow them occasionally in the fall and spring to allow the nesting species that I knew as a child uh, whether it's bobolinks and meadowlarks, uh, to use some of these grasslands in meadows. Stewardship is uh, really a word that I first heard when I read Aldo Leopold's uh, works, and the understanding that uh, the government uh, can't protect it all for us. And if, in fact, if they tried to do it, they sometimes might uh, love it to death. Uh, in some areas of the country, that's, that's happened, uh, in areas that we've tried to protect. Uh, individual landowners really can do a huge amount to help preserve the native species that have historically been here. Across the watershed, people are finding ways to decrease the pressure placed on the river's resources. In attempting to balance the needs of an ever-increasing population with finite natural resources, signs of hope are emerging. One strategy to reduce sprawl is evolved from enlightened urban design. We need livable cities because if we don't um, live in our cities, then as population grows, it spreads, and it spreads out across all different types of landscapes. And where we are, we consider quite urbanized, and in other parts of the country, they're urbanizing. And so as we sit around worried about the rate of sprawl increasing, uh, we seem somewhat at a loss as to figure out what can we do about it. This is a city, Northampton, Massachusetts, that remembers what to do about it. They have um, principles here that have been in practice in other places in the world, like Europe, for millennia. So it's a city that people feel comfortable and safe in. It has a nice blend of commerce on the first floor of the buildings and then residences above that. There's tree line, so it's shaded. There are outdoor cafes. And uh, it's a city that just feels good to be in. And one of the things that I think people here remember is that cities aren't dead zones. They're places uh, that people need to care about and it makes a place worth living in. We've also really tried to figure out over the long term, uh, how are we gonna find this balance? Yes, helping to slow down the rate of sprawl by making cities livable is one of it. And I think that's something that most of us hadn't really uh, been aware of. So that's very positive. But also really uh, giving up the notion that we can't work together across political boundaries, you know, from one town to the next, one county to the next, one state to the next. Uh, I really see signs that we're ready to do that in the East and I think across America to really figure out what, what's the vision that we need to have for 
uh, how we want to live on the land and how we can put the least pressure on the land. More and more, the real power to make positive changes lies with educating and empowering a concerned public. Creating new allies can move these issues toward a more desirable future. So the question is, with this great threat of, of uh, increasing development in this last great place, what do we do? The greatest difference that we can make is going to come from working with the communities themselves. And what we have found is that it is not as though the, the collective uh, communities and the people that make up these communities don't care. To a large extent, they don't have a connection to this resource, um, but they still know they love it. There is, there is some connection they have, but they don't necessarily have the tools or knowledge as to how to make a difference. It is complex. Some of the reasons we're able to do what we're doing is because of the, um, the, the fact that the residents care about it, and there's a certain affluence here that can fund it. What generates that income is the same things that in some ways degrade the environment. So that's a balancing act. One of the challenges with anadromous fish restoration is some of the species we're dealing with have been regionally extinct for 200 years. Atlantic salmon is one example, but there are others. And so not only do the residents of this town not know of that species, their grandparents didn't know about these species. And so part of the process isn't just restoring the fish and building structures. Part of it is re-educating the public about the resource itself and what it is and, and what it needs, but also the value of it. Conservation, since it's not short term, has to be managed long term. And the idea behind our program is to get that local involvement where once we are no longer there or the federal or state government is no longer there, we have a core of people who care about their river, their fish. So there is a uh, synergy, in essence, that goes beyond the actual putting in the fishway or uh, taking out the dam that the community takes on and, and works on through time. Here in the Connecticut River Valley, we want run from very, very uh, wild lands at 4th Connecticut Lake up at the headwaters near the Canadian border, right on down to Long Island Sound. Through very urbanized areas of Springfield, Massachusetts and Hartford, Connecticut, to a very rural and really wild estuary. So we're tussling with how you work with people and the private sector in preserving our rural landscape, in preserving our wild lands and our uh, natural and cultural heritage. Um, and the way we seem to be able to do it is through partnership. Preserving these rural and wild areas presents a challenge and an opportunity for natural resource managers. Making connections with the people and the land, making sure that migratory fish and bird species have a chance to thrive. These actions will ensure this unique landscape can remain for generations to come. The people just really want to do the right thing. And so if we can show them what the right thing is and they understand it, then they just take right over. I think we have a lot to, to tell uh, people in other parts of the country as to how government and the private sector can work in partnership and succeed in, in terms of building their economy as well as preserving the, the things that we hold dear in our hearts. For people in a small town to be able to go out and see um, shad or salmon or, or alewives come up their stream and realize that that's not only a connection with the ocean, but that's a connection with the past. That really connects with the people because, frankly, that's one of the reasons people live here, because they want to live in a rural area that has functioning ecosystem. David Dobbs from Vermont wrote it in an article that in a, a watershed that dies of a thousand cuts or that's dying of a thousand cuts, you need a thousand band-aids and shields. And I think that's really what we're facing in this struggle to maintain water quality and, and other things is that it used to be that you could just have a, a point source of pollution going into the river and EPA would come in and fix that with the Clean Water Act. And now we're dealing with a lot more subtle problems, the thousand cuts, if you will, non-point non source pollution. And again, it's it's all of us causing these stresses, and so you need all of us to affect the solution. 
there's one very exciting, uh, optimistic, hopeful thing about all of the challenges that we face and uh, living in a part of the country that has been developed uh, for a long time, it was under uh, intensive management before Europeans even got here, is the willingness of the people to come together to really figure out what are we dealing with and how are we going to make things right for the short and the long term. You can talk about restoring fish, but what we're really doing is we're restoring a portion of the ecosystem.